Let's start off with our, our first question. If I could ask the questioner, if I'm to stand up, uh, there's a roving mic here, uh, and uh, speak into the, into the mic, but our first question comes from Richard Walker of, of Apius Group. Richard. Hi, yeah, good morning. I'll continue the, uh, the theme of threes. There are three parts to the question. Uh, the first one is, how does the uh, UK government plan to support um, oil and gas export in the UK? Um, what are their ambitions for exports? And crucially, I think, how are we going to make sure we can accurately measure it? Dr. Cable, could we come to you first on that one? Would that be all right? Well, I, I think Michael in particular talked about the work of UKTI, which is, I think, a, a reformed and much more focused institution than it was a few years ago, uh, working with the business sector and particularly with small, medium-sized companies who I think have felt that didn't really have access at the right level and now do. Um, I, I, Edward may want to say specifically about oil and gas as such, but I, I mean I think it's the supplier companies who are really where the, where the business really is, and uh, I, I think from the Prime Minister down, we've had you know real leadership in terms of export missions. Uh, I mean I'm, I think I've been three times to India. I'm going for a second time to Brazil very soon, to China, to Indonesia, all of the key emerging markets. We are spending a lot of time developing those markets, and in several of them, oil and gas is a key, a key sector. So we are focused on it. We're, we're there to support. There is strong institutional backup. As regards basic metrics, I mean, I've always been a bit skeptical about setting export targets, but in some countries, partly because the countries themselves ask for it, like China and India, we do have specific quantities of objectives that we measure ourselves against. Just briefly, um, before I got this job, I was working under Vince uh, as the trade minister, uh, so it was extremely focused on exports for the whole of the, of the UK, um, and we uh, developed something called the Trade Investment White Paper, which is a framework for how we can uh, work with uh, industry uh, to, to make this happen, and obviously Lord Green, uh, working with Vince, is now taking that forward. And uh, the, the Cabinet subcommittee that was driving that, I think, uh, really did begin to change things in a quite significant way in terms of the overall framework for helping uh, exporters. But for the industry specifically, as Vince says, I think it's one of the things that we're always mentioning when we're going abroad and engaging with other governments, uh, and that's part of that sort of soft diplomacy. I think I'd only uh, finally add that getting it right in the North Sea is actually the critical bit. Because in talking <coughs> to the industry, it seems that the uh, the skills, the uh, engineering innovations and other technology innovations that you develop here for the North Sea act as a sort of springboard to the rest of the world. So uh, one of the best things we can do is get it right here uh, and allow UK companies, be they directly oil and gas or in the supply chain, to benefit as most from the North Sea investment because that will then be the catalyst and the, and, and the, uh, and the push. All right, thanks so much. Should we move on to the, to, to the next question, which comes from Ken Robertson of, of Shell, and Ken is also <coughs> co-chair of Step Change and Safety. Ken is here. Can we get a mic to Ken? Morning. Yeah, the, the question I have is, what are the specific measures that government can take to redress the perceptions that the oil and gas is a sunset industry in the UK? Michael, do you want to start on that one? I hope it is clear from this morning, Ken, that uh, we are very confident about the future of this sector, not just here in Aberdeen and, and the wider Scottish economy, but across the UK as a whole. Building on the back of that, uh, the real expertise that we are now exporting, and you know, having seen myself how uh, with the, the bigger uh, exploration production companies as they've gone around the world have dragged the supply chain with them, not exactly kicking and screaming, but providing real opportunity. We've got here real expertise that we are getting abroad and that we can continue for many decades to come, it seems to me, to develop a, that global presence that I talked of in my earlier remarks. It is very important that we are consistent in talking about the industry in a positive light. Again, three secretaries of state here today saying you know, the same thing, making sure that we've got that message, making sure that across government, it's our job, uh, we get that message uh, consistent as well. But I think there's a job for all of us to do. I think that having made something of the fact that Malcolm, Robert and Anne are here today, you have in your parliamentarians in this area of Scotland 
the leading experts anywhere in British politics. They know the stuff inside out. They promote your sector brilliantly. My challenge to ourselves and to you is, how do we make sure the rest of the UK understands that? How do we make sure that those 200,000 people who are employed outside Scotland in this sector, actually, their MPs are world experts in this too? What have you done recently yourselves to talk to your local MPs if you don't live in this part of the country? How well do we talk to each other? So the theme of partnership needs to exist at lots of different uh, levels. But I hope that in real terms, through the last couple of years, particularly with the new fiscal incentives that have gone for the brownfield and the small field uh, areas, the, what we're doing to encourage decommissioning, the draft clause in the, in the finance bill uh, available, the pr uh, template contracts becoming available, people can see that long-term commitment, not just to the to, uh, uh, UK continental shelf, but to what follows in decommissioning. There's a lot of complex moving parts here, but the overriding message from us today, which we will continue to have in partnership with you, is this is a global leading sector based here in Aberdeen uh, that has got bags of potential for a very long time to come. Thanks, Mark. Do you have any thoughts upon that, about how the industry can help? Well, it, it's, uh, if we're talking about the rest of the decade, I mean, the, the more pessimistic predictions are level production and the more optimistic ones are significant increase. So that's not compatible with a kind of sunset kind of story at all. Um, and uh, and I, I hate this phrase, sunset industries, because what does it mean? I mean, if, you, if you'd go back two or three decades and you'd ask what was the kind of sunset industry, it was the British car industry. It was a joke. Uh, but actually, it's now one of our most dynamic and successful rapidly exporting industries, completely turned around by technology and good management. Absolutely no reason, whatever, why the oil and gas industry shouldn't have the same trajectory. Yeah. All right, thanks. Malcolm, we'll go can I just add yes, one, sorry, of the elements, go sorry. one of the key elements in the strategy is um, it's also the public perception. So the industry is embarking on a project, and also you'll see the government have also committed to reviewing their position and what they can do on that in terms of the public as well. Yep. Thanks, Gordon. We've we'll gone to the next question, which is from uh, Professor Alex Kemp from Aberdeen University. I see Alex is over here. So, um, my, my, my question relates to uh, <coughs> the recently published um, long-term production uh, projections that published uh, on the NEC website, which show uh, continuous um, decreases from 2012 or in a long period in the 2030s. Um, um, so the question is, isn't this um, uh, rather um, defeatist? Uh, and um, shouldn't um, a strategy um, involve policies which can uh, ensure that the um, higher productive capability, which is foreseen by uh, Oil and Gas UK and others, is uh, realised? Thanks, Alex. Right. Given that this is from my department, I'd better take it. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm almost tempted to refer to what my right or friend said earlier with respect to uh, uh, the over a century, what people have been saying about peak oil and uh, how there are a lot of different forecasts out there and uh, it's got to be take a little, some of them a little bit of a pinch of salt. Um, but to, to be direct, because figures published by department, my department are important because they set a tone they set, send a signal, um, uh, and so we take them seriously. Um, uh, I actually think we're <coughs> optimistic. Um, we wouldn't be here today with this strategy if we weren't optimistic. We wouldn't be aiming to try to maximize the potential uh, of extraction for, from the North Sea if we didn't think that was possible. Um, but if you look in the detailed statistics, as actually Vince alluded to, you know, our central forecast is for uh, you know, production to go at current levels for some time and then to uh, gradually decline after that. That's not unusual for a mature basin, but we think there could be an upside as well. Um, but recently some of our projections have been over-optimistic. I think it's also important that we're realistic as well. If you're uh, investing in industry, you, you, you want to know there's a future, uh, but you also want to know that someone's not trying to kid you. So we're trying to base our uh, estimates on 
the best possible data, learning from uh, uh, the past predictions, to try to get it right. But I don't think anyone should take away from the forecast that we're in any way negative. For quite the contrary. We, we think if we can uh, turn around the declines we've seen in recent years, and there have been some steep declines, let's be honest, if we can turn those round that, uh, and even go on a f flat production, hopefully with an upside, that is quite some achievement. Uh, and uh, we're going to strain every, every sinew to make that happen. Yeah. I mean, if I could just add, I think, um, I think what's probably important is that we should all get around the table and look at this data and come, try and come to a more consistent and common view on it. And uh, I, think, I think everybody's up for that, aren't they? And, uh, Absolutely. And that's, what we'll be looking to, that's certainly what we'll be looking to do. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Can we uh, now move to, uh, to Phil Kirk, who, who's got a question here in the, in the front from Chrysler? Oh, yeah. And Alex has stolen a bit of my question. In the context of looking 30 years out to 2040, where we're still having 70% of the UK's energy from oil and gas, where do you actually see UK <coughs> fitting into that 30 years out? And then just an adjunct to that, where would you see smaller EMP companies or smaller EMP companies now fitting into that mix? Okay, so future thoughts about uh, production and, wh and what do we think about uh, the, the position of small um, oil companies? Who would like to lead on that? Well, um, <laughs> it's you go ahead, ahead. I, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to have a go. I mean, I, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, one of the, the uh, critical advantages of having such a brilliant oil and gas industry here in the UK uh, is energy security. Uh, so one of the things we, we want to, to achieve by this engagement uh, and by trying to maximise the potential extraction uh, from the uh, uh, North Sea is to, to have that. At the moment, we are... We are in, seeing increasing imports uh, of uh, oil and gas. That's increased that import dependency quite significantly, and that has a number of uh, extra challenges. Longer supply chains, which are more difficult when you're assessing energy security uh, issues. So um, it is completely in our interest to try to maintain that. And you mentioned the role of, of small companies. Well, um, the, my department over a number of years actually has been trying to make sure that smaller companies can get into the market uh, and given the maturity of the basin we think that's actually well suited the new technology that needed a lot of SMEs who are really uh, you know world innovators world leaders in those sectors so it's important that we enable that Thanks. if you look at things like the brownfield allowances and particularly decommissioning my judgment is, based on the discussions I've held with different people in this room and, and more broadly over time, is that those two combined provide the kind of liquidity in the market that allows some of the older fields to be traded through so that smaller companies uh, are, who are t will look at them anew and use different technologies, different business models to exploit resources which otherwise might not uh, be uh, obtained. And the decommissioning underpinning ensures that people understand where the liabilities will lie in the, in the long term and that there will be appropriate tax support uh, for that. Without Th those allowances and that decommissioning support, uh, I think smaller companies would necessarily be more averse to investing. Uh, but I hope we are getting the balance right on that and giving, particularly, well, every every player of every size in the, in the uh, in the UKCS the incentives they need to keep investing. Thanks very much. Um, I think we've got. I'm sorry, we will be posting answers on the website. Um, but I think we've got time for another couple of questions. Um, the next one on the list is. Terry Savage from uh, Global Energy Group. Um, I can see Terry's down, down here. So can we get the... Uh... Yeah, it was just... Uh... I'll share that anyway. I wonder if the government could tell us, uh, what it, explain what it means by a closer collaboration between the oil and gas and the renewable sectors. Uh, I think Ed, can you... Yeah, one yeah. thing. Um, well, let me be clear, it's, we're not trying to force industries to do something they don't want to do. That's not what we're about uh, at all. Uh, but we've certainly noticed some in different parts of uh, the industries collaboration already <coughs> happening uh, because of mutual advantage. Uh, you've seen it in subsea, you've seen it in fabrication, you've seen it in a number of areas. And so uh, one of the reasons in the strategy is we want to try to see if there's any more that can be got out that's in the, again in the mutual interest 
of players in both, uh, it, well, in all uh, energy sectors through uh, closer working. And in the North Sea, uh, let's be clear, it's the same space. You're going to have a lot of operators in the same space. So one's going to think about it from a regulatory perspective and a uh, health and safety perspective to m make sure that the industries are, are, are collaborating because they're in the same space. A lot of the skills are going to be the same. Um, some of the skills that the oil and gas industry, industry have, uh, world leading skills, will be really helpful for offshore wind and, uh, and CCS and so on. Uh, I think uh, some of the issues, monitoring of the seabed, environmental impact, health and safety, uh, you know, the, the, we don't want to reinvent the wheel uh, and I think there's real opportunities for oil and gas uh, in uh, working uh, collaboratively, because I just think there's some, some, frankly, some money to be made, and we want to to facilitate that without uh, uh, for forcing it. I think there's also a perception issue. I think actually, with uh, it seeing the North Sea and the energy sector together, I think that sends a very strong signal to the public and to young people wanting to work in energy. That you can have an energy career uh, that maybe spans different sectors. Now that won't be appropriate for for all companies for all parts of the two industries, but be, there is clearly an overlap. You know, the Venn, there's a big <coughs> intersection of the Venn diagrams there. Thanks very much. I saw lots of heads nodding there. I think you hit a few na nails on the head there. Um, okay. Um, sorry, this is going to be the last question. I do apologize. I've just asked them in the order that, that, that they were presented to me. Uh, but the last question comes from Trevor Garlick uh, of BP. And I can see that Trevor again is down here in the, in the front row. Uh, is he, if we could get the... Uh, thank you. Good morning. Great to see you all here. Um, I spend a lot of time staving off decommissioning, um, but there does seem to be uh, a unique opportunity coming our way in that there's a whole new industrial sector that you know could be created and we could take advantage of here uh, in Scotland and in the UK. I wonder what you think about government and industry working together to make sure we capture that in the supply chain uh, and are prepared for it in, in the sense of the skills we might need. Okay. Can I come to the Secretary of State, uh, if you watch your thinking about this? Can we just start with Gordon? Would you like to sort of say a few words on that, and then we'll come along the line, if that's okay? Yeah, no, so briefly, um, I think clarity of the opportunities, um, and uh, DECOM North Sea are doing an excellent job of that. We were working as Oil and Gas UK for that. There's an event yesterday in Aberdeen. Um, I think one key element that strikes me is we need to come up with some innovative solutions. I think it's been said before, we're kind of dismantling things the way we put them together. Maybe there's some real different thoughts out there. And I think longer term might be really useful for the UK sector to come out with that kind of thing, some real innovation around it. The first um, oil and gas related event that I participated in after I was appointed was a decommissioning uh, conference uh, two and a half uh, years ago. And that to me showed the long-term thinking in the industry but also the complexity Gordon's referred to uh, in terms of what it is the task we're taking on so um, you keep going at pushing it off to the right uh, Trevor as long as you can but I think that you're right we need to trap that and what we do together to enable the thinking the R&D and other things to be done now so that we are positioned properly when the moment arrives is criti critical and that's why we can't just imagine this is some way off the, the, the real decisions the real thinking has got to be done now Thanks. Yeah. if we really grasp this properly uh, actually it's going to lead to huge investments uh, and staving it off actually can lead to huge investments. One of the reasons why we've, uh, with the Treasury, have grasped the tax side, and we've laying draft clauses, I think today, uh, if not today, very soon, uh, for the, the finance bill, for you guys to look at before uh, they are debated in committee, is to make sure we can uh, give clarity and long-term certainty on the tax regime. So this notion of decommissioning deeds, I think, is very important, which uh, we'll, we'll help that. And our analysis shows that by just by doing that, we've helped unlock a lot of capital to invest, just by giving that certainty on the decommissioning tax regime. So that's part of it. But I think also we have a wind of opportunity over the next few years in the North Sea. Because we are seeing a lot of investment, because uh, we are now working, I think, extremely collaboratively, uh, we've got an opportunity to, to think again about uh, uh, decommissioning, whether we can keep those more assets in place for longer using innovative solutions. 
um, where things actually do have to be taken out and decommissioned, making sure that the supply chain in the UK gets benefits from that. So, you know, we may have to look at special port infrastructure and, you know, uh, uh, and that type of uh, uh, issue. But, uh, you know, we're open to, to, to working together to make that happen. Well, just a few quick points to round out. I mean, I, th I think <coughs> sometimes in parts of industry there is a – people go a bit weak at the knees when they hear government ministers talking about partnerships and industrial strategies. Are we going back to the 70s and all that? I mean, this is absolutely not what we're about. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of companies that basically just want the government out of the way, and we, we respect that. I mean, you know, they want less regulation, easier tax, and just get on with their businesses. And that, we, we understand that's how a lot of business functions. But there are parts of business that do require kind of long-term certainty, you know, about the tax regime, about regulation, uh, and about the things that we can do. I mean, there are things government can do that business won't do on its own. A lot of the kind of blue skies end of research is one. Um, manpower planning, you know, the school system, you know, just actually getting back into the schools to make sure you get the right kind of pipeline coming through for trained people. And those are things we've got to focus on and business get on with its job. But if, if, if the industry feels that what we're doing here is useful, then we, we have a time check. We're going to meet three times a year for our council, yep. Gordon chairs. And uh, if you feel it's useful, we, we put in more effort. If you feel that this isn't useful, we just back off and let you get on the way you've always done things. So th this is a, it's, it's it, it, you know, it, as I think Ronald Reagan once said this uh, in a negative way, so, you know, the, the worst words in the English language were from the government and we're here to help. <laughs> that we, we, but we, 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 we actually mean that. I mean, we are here to help. Uh, but if you don't find it useful, we can we disengage, you know. Yeah. That's great, thanks. That's a, a great note to, to finish on. And uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. If I, if I may, on uh, your behalf, I'd like to thank, for, I mean, first the questioners. And those questioners whose questions weren't put, don't worry, they will, they will be put. Thanks for the questions. But thank you particularly for, to all of our speakers this morning. I think you'll agree with me, have given a very, very insightful and, and, and thoughtful and intelligent uh, reflection upon our industry and where we can go. And I do commend this document to your reading. I think it is an excellent document. I think it shows a way forward. And I think we have to regard this as a living document too as well. It's something that we'll live and breathe and we need to develop it as is appropriate with the changing circumstances and over time. So I think it, it forms the basis for a, a great and an extended partnership, if I might put that, with, with, with government and right across government. And I think that's, that's very good too. Um, I'm going to ask you, if I might now, for you all please to stay in, in your seats because I need to lead these gentlemen off that way and take them to, to the press conference. But just before they go, would you please join me in thanking them in the usual way. For this